Okay, I think we can start. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us at this panel discussion on the future of jobs in ASEAN. My name is Warren Fernandez, and I'm the editor-in-chief of, of The Straits Times, which is the main English-language newspaper and media organization in Singapore. Uh, we've been hearing over the last day or two about the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, it's been a constant theme, and this is the process of unrelenting and sweeping changes that's rolling out across all our countries, all our industries. And just to bring that point home, I was reflecting on, on this on my way here from Singapore. I think like many of you, um, my flight and my um, hotel accommodation was booked online and paid for by digital banking. My ride from home to the airport was booked on an app. Uh, fortunately, the driver was still human, but uh, I don't think that would be the case for very much longer, given all the trials they're doing in Singapore on automotive vehicles. Uh, when I boarded the plane, usually these days, and especially if I'm flying on my favorite airline, Singapore Airlines, uh, an attendant brings me a copy of a newspaper, and I guess to humor me, they bring me my own newspaper. And they give me reading material, and they serve me uh, my favorite wine or champagne, and I once was puzzled by this and I asked, how, how do you know what my preferences are? And the young lady says to me, oh sir, it's machine learning. <laughs> and the computer system that they have is capturing data about your preferences and it brings up this data before you even board the plane. And the airline is using data to improve its service. Uh, yesterday I met a gentleman who was telling me about how machine learning is improving so much that there are now devices which can do live translations, even as you speak, to a high level of accuracy. So we could have a conversation like this, and it would be translated into Vietnamese or Chinese or Japanese, high level of accuracy. The implications for translators, also a bit troubling in the process. So I think the fourth industrial revolution that we've been talking about opens up many, many opportunities for all of us but it's also giving rise to a lot of angst and anxieties in all our societies, and we're seeing that play out in the populist pressures that are emerging in, in uh, many countries. And I think those anxieties and those that the angst over it can be summed up in just one word, jobs. And that's what we're here to discuss today. And some of the issues I think we'd like to get into, just to, to frame the discussion, is Will we still have jobs? Will there be enough jobs to go around? And what are these jobs of tomorrow? What are the skills that we will need to do those jobs? Will the idea of a job and work change? And how do we ensure our young, and by that I mean both our young boys and girls, will be prepared for these jobs of the future? And how do we reskill the not so young? You know, whether it's through apprenticeships and lifelong learning, I think that's something we want to get into in the discussion. And which companies and which countries are ahead of the curve in this and, and doing things to help prepare people for the jobs that are coming. Maybe we can hear a bit from the Deputy Prime Minister about what Vietnam is doing and what can we learn from those more progressive countries. Let me just start with a few key points from the WEF's own studies about jobs. 65% of the children entering primary school today will end up doing a job that does not even exist today. Mm -hmm. By 2020, more than a third of the core skills that you need to perform the jobs will not be skills we consider even crucial today. And the most recent survey by the WEF, which was just released on Tuesday, interestingly showed a high level of optimism amongst the young. Um, majorities of the people surveyed across the region felt that the new technologies would bring more jobs and higher incomes. And uh, interestingly, the Vietnamese were one of the most uh, optimistic about the future. The least optimistic were unfortunately my own compatriots in Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> and well, to discuss all of these issues, we have a very distinguished and diverse panel. Let me just introduce them very briefly. We're honored to have the Deputy Prime Minister of Vietnam, Mr. Vu Duc Dam. Um, Next to him, um, Ms. Vivian Lau, who is president of JA Asia Pacific, a non-profit group based in Hong Kong that prepares young people for employment and entrepreneurship. And Vivian has just told me that JA is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year, so congratulations. Uh, Mr. Ian Lee, a compatriot from Singapore, uh, 
who is Asia-Pacific Regional Head for the ADECO Group, a talent and recruitment search company. Ideal person to tell us about the jobs of the future. Uh, Francesca Chia, an entrepreneur, CEO and co-founder of GoGet. And I was hearing yesterday on a different panel you were at about the workplace of the future. So I'd be interested to hear that perspective later on. And then last but not least, Mr. Haoling Su, who is Assistant Administrator and Director of the Regional Bureau for Asia and the Pacific of the UNDP. But let me get the ball rolling by posing a few questions to the DPM. You know, given the optimism in your country about the future and jobs and technology, maybe you can tell us a bit about the, the perspective from the point of view of the Vietnamese government. You know, how do you see the challenges and the opportunities about the jobs that are coming? And what do you think the government can do? And what is the government of Vietnam doing in, in, on that front? Well, once more, I have to say, welcome to Vietnam. Thank you. And um, I will talk in Vietnamese. Sure. So we'll ask assistance from the interpreter. Okay. In hoping that in the near future, we don't need no more human interpreters. <laughs> uh, so, uh... Well, good morning, everyone. Well, as our dear moderator said, According to his study, the Vietnamese in general, especially the youth in Vietnam, are very much optimistic about the opportunities and prospects of the IR 4.0. Of course, we are aware of the challenges, but from policymakers' perspective, we're not only optimistic, but indeed, we need to think more about challenges. The reasons are, first, we have been talking extensively about new jobs brought about by IR 4.0, and many of them will be replaced, especially the jobs that are very popular in Vietnam, like in textile and footwear construction works. or in electronics assembling factories or secretaries, jobs often employed uh, by women. We are having challenges on how to retrain them, to give them new skills, or move them to other professions, akin to other countries. But in Vietnam, 38% are still in the agricultural sector. So we do not only have challenge to move people from one sector to other sector, but we also have to move people from the agricultural sector to the services and manufacturing sector. <coughs> so I think first for those who are still in the agricultural sector or those in services and manufacturing, they need to learn new skills to adapt to new jobs and to be able to create their own jobs, their own employment. For instance, 38% of the farmers, what they should do, they should apply the new skills and also new technologies so that they can sell their goods and services to people in other countries and around the world. And second, we have been talking about the new challenges in employment and opportunities. We need to promote lifelong learning, especially for the elderly and those who are not very young. But when we talk about lifelong learning and the people who are no longer young, but often we think about people from 30 and above, but we do not often think about the elderly, f those who are 60s and above. We have been thinking less of them. So I think this IR needs to bring challenges, uh, bring about opportunities to all, equal opportunities to all. So we need to help the elderly, 60s and above, 
to adapt to this uh, IR. And for the young people in Vietnam, we have been taking actions to reform our education. Although our students are praised around the world for their excellence, but I think from the very early age, we need to educate them about the challenges that they need to expect and we need to help them to think out of the box to have critical thinking and out of the box thinking and for the past many years it has been it has been a tradition in vietnam to educate the students to be obedient so i think we need to reform the education in Vietnam, especially for the mindset of the young students, to help them to think out of the box. And today we have the IT technologies to help them access to education online without the need of teachers. So in Vietnam, we have put in place plans to create database of knowledge so that people, even the elderly, they can have access to those knowledge through online uh, technologies to be able to adapt to the new changes. Thank you. Very interesting that you want your people to be less obedient. I mean, <laughs> but I, what I took away from that is that the education has to happen at different points of the spectrum. So from a very young age, I mean, Vietnam is blessed with a, a youthful population, which is a big asset, but you need also to train them at that young age, but reskill them over the years as they as they grow older. Are there programs in Vietnam for reskilling and re-education? And does the government have these infrastructure programs to help people along at different points of their career? Chúng uh, tôi <coughs> well, we have lots of plans and projects, projects that has to do with reforming the <coughs> curriculum from the secondary to vocational training. We're trying to match our curriculum to the level of other ASEAN countries and the world. And I think we need to work closely in order to promote the mutual recognition of qualifications, sharing uh, teaching materials so that we can maximize our strength. But because of the uniqueness uh, characteristics of the Vietnamese uh, education system. Mm -hmm. So from next year, we are launching new textbooks for students from the first, uh, from the primary classes to increase the proportion of STEM uh, <coughs> courses while encouraging them to respect the tradition to encourage them to question the teachers. And for the elderly, we're trying to develop an ecosystem of Vietnamese knowledge, which is more digital. We will try to compile knowledge from Vietnam and around the world, compile them into questions and answers, which are simple, easily accessible, accessible and understandable by people from all age groups and will encourage the young startups to make use of that database to come up with to develop hundreds of smart apps so those young staff apps mm -hmm. may develop their own careers and their apps might be useful to many for instance apps, especially in language training, have been developed for the tourists so that an elderly, when he has a smartphone and we, he or she travel overseas, then he may use that apps to travel overseas as tourists to ask simple questions. And so we're having a project to expand the coverage of broadband and uh, smartphone usage. Today, about 57% of our population are using smartphones, and we're trying to increase this number. And after a few years, and then we'll try to achieve a level 
where the level of uh, smartphone or digital literacy of people will increase. Maybe Ian, I could bring you in at this point because you run a regional business looking at talent. And could you give us a sense of how this plays out across the region? Are there are differences, of course, from country to country. What are the opportunities and the challenges with regards to jobs? Um, I think the, 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 the problem or the issues that uh, we talk about in terms of uh, lifelong learning is, uh, is, is fairly consistent across, across the region. I think we need to uh, break this thing up into a few angles um, from the very, very basics. I think, um, you know, I think one thing that is consistent is, is that changes are inevitable, inevitable in the futures. So, you know, it's, it's actually very difficult even for, for us to predict what types of jobs are in existence 10 years from now mm. and what types of jobs are not going to be in existence 10 years from now. 10 years from now, before, think about this, 10 years before, I do not think we, we heard of a job called cyber security <laughs> analyst, okay? Mm. It's, uh, it's probably one of the hottest jobs at this point of time uh, in the world. Unfortunately. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I think uh, there are a couple of angles I would basically put into this. One, I think the, the, the parents need to prepare their kids as they're growing up uh, in terms of the changes. So, you know, uh, I think parents today probably cannot be thinking from what they, how they grew up standpoint in terms of uh, educating their kids. Mm. So it has to be an open-minded uh, society. Just now, uh, uh, Vice Premier talked about uh, STEM education. Mm. That's very important. But, uh, you know, I think the hottest uh, uh, types of people that uh, overall people are looking at uh, people with, uh, with STEM or IT skills, uh, but also soft skills. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's just not uh, uh, machines, you know. We are not going to train machines. Then I think, you know, if you look across the whole region, um, you know, there are very different states of, uh, of, of populations, uh, I would say demographics. Vietnam is very young. Uh, Japan can be very old, you know, the, it's more maturing uh, populations. So, you know, I think over the time uh, of uh, a per person career or lifespan, uh, there's probably, you know, one fact is that you're not going to start as accountant and finish as accountant 30 years from now. Accounting job might be replaced. Right. So, you know, I think this whole lifelong learning uh, how to reskill people at different stage of their life, it's actually becoming very, very important. I think new skills, I mean, my newspaper recently ran a story about the number of people signing up to learn to drive just going down. And people were thinking that going forward, this may not be a skill I need. And if you think back to, say, early 19th century, 20th century, probably a young person growing up would want to learn to ride a horse, but nobody these days really signs up to learn to ride a horse, just as driving will no longer be necessary when you have autonomous vehicles. So that change in the kinds of skills that will be valued and, and rewarded, I think is something we need to think about. In fact, there was a, a study done by the World Bank which looked at the kinds of skills people needed, and you've touched on it. Uh, digital literacy, human skills, education reform, and lifelong learning. And Vivian, I think you've been working in this area for, for some time, you know, trying to train and prepare our young people. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about the kind of um, preparation they most need. Thanks for that. I think to start with, I think what the, uh, our minister here said and Yen said are really music to our ears. But I want to go back to the core of the fourth industrial revolution. At the end of the day, every revolution is supposed to bring about better life for all our citizens around the world. And I believe at the heart of the fourth industrial revolution is the human revolution. And at the heart of the human revolution is the education revolution that we've all been talking about. And I, I want to talk about some specific examples building on to what we've heard earlier. So there is a concern about whether our young people will be prepared for the future. Yes, of course, because there is no one that has complete mastery or complete monopoly of the kind of skills and knowledge that we will need in the future. Why? Because nobody can predict the future. But there is no silver bullet either. 
So what will be the ways that we can actually co-create the journey with our youth or co-evolution with our youth? So in terms of specific examples of how the work that we do, we bring young people together to actually address some of the elderly issues that you've talked about because, you know, by the way, we all are going to live till 120 years old. We know that, okay? So if we are talking about elderly at the age of 60, that is far too young to be called an elderly. So education is really taking on many segments and education can no longer be transactional and can no longer be functional as what Ian said. So education has got to be a lot more broad-based and has got to be more fluid. So how do we actually bring about different generations? We are working with young people to actually engage our not so young, but still very strong, right? Not so young, on getting them to be digitally engaged. Because one of the biggest challenges for elderly is the digital disengagement and therefore leading to them not having the, com uh, the competency and also the confidence in life. But I think coming back as well is in terms of the role that civil society can play, I think civil society and for those who are in this room, there is a big role for us to play here. Because Governments don't have complete knowledge of the skills that will be required, nor do businesses have the complete knowledge of the skills that will be required. There will be a need for, if you like, a neutral third party to try to bring about as much transparency as possible of the skills that are required. And also, there is a role for civil society to think about how to bridge the gap. How do we take education truly as a lifelong journey? and if I may submit to businesses organization in this room. So yesterday I was in another panel about breaking barriers women on entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. right? If we really want to prepare everybody for the future of jobs, apart from maternity leave, apart from paternity leave, can organizations consider giving educational leave to your people at different stages of their career so they take responsibility for themselves to make sure that they are you know retrained so that they learn unlearn and relearn for the future so consider giving your employees educational leave and for all of us that are involved in the education space consider bringing the companies closer to the classroom mm -hmm. so that together businesses and educators can co-create the future and co-evolve together. Because at the end of the day, fourth industrial revolution is human revolution and education evolution. So education revolution and, and evolution, I mean, it seems to me the core skill there is that ability to keep learning, the le learning to learn, and that, that resilience to be able to sort of shift and adapt as you go along. Is that something you're seeing a demand for from people across the board, young, old, not so, not so old? I definitely, I think we need to think about, no, we, nobody has a crystal ball, but we need to think about where does AI and robot live and where do humans start, mm. right? That is a good way to think about you know, preparing our youth or preparing ourselves because we're all going to live to 120 years old. We're going to have a few career changes in our lives. But at the same time, I think apart from having that critical thinking, creativity, and you know, complex problem solving, I think there has to be a lot of humility in all of us. There needs to be a lot of humbleness in all of us. And as the world moves faster, I think we need to think about living slower. So there is a, there is a really oxymoronic kind of you know, relationship that we need to strike. As the world moves faster, we also need to think about how to move slower mm. so that everybody can really be moving forward in harmony and with compassion. You continue to remain human and enjoy a human existence. <laughs> yes. But Francesca, I'm interested to hear your, your thoughts because you were on a separate panel yesterday on Workplace 4.0. And you made an interesting remark about how young people don't see going to work from 9 to 5 as the way of working in the future. And it might be working from 5 to 6. And that flexibility in, in the whole idea of what a job is. Maybe you could tell us a bit about that. So a little bit of background on what I do, I connect businesses to part-timers in our platform. And these part-timers can do jobs from one hour for five hours 
Monday only or the whole week. So it's really a lot about, about flexibility. And the aspect I really wanted to kind of just point out is actually not just youth. It's actually what I believe is the future of work. It is not just going to be for the 20 or 30 year olds. We have 60 year olds coming into our training centers, getting educated and being involved in the career of doing flexible work. And I think this is one aspect I wanted to also address in terms of how we upskilling or including people who are older, as you were mentioning, um, they don't feel engaged. But by doing jobs or by adopting technology like GoGet, they're able to firstly just educate themselves digitally. It's not using a smartphone. The retirees that walk in, sometimes they come in without a smartphone and then they first get it by doing our technology. And that's just the first step you need to do before we can upskill them. So I'm talking about even the first step of digital literacy and even valuing the undervalued today or the not included today before we can just even upskill and leapfrog. So what I mean by that is even the people who are not involved in the workforce today um, because they don't graduate from degrees, but they're fully capable individuals that should be able to work. So with GoGet, they actually are able to start getting flexible job, get included, and then that's the first step. So I believe that a lot of this is also, yes, great to also upskill the today's people who, are, who have work and to move them up the value chain, but also how do we include those that are not included first? That's really important for the first step right. so that we can also move them up. But it's a huge mindset change, right? I mean, Vivian has told us we're all going to live to 120, <laughs> right? And over the course of that 120 plus years, we have to keep changing and adapting. Yeah. I mean, do the young people that you engage or the not so young people that you engage find that uh, exciting prospect? Uh, do they have that mental resilience and human yeah. adaptability to, to change? Well, I'd love to share a little bit also what um, the platform does to address this and to build this kind of mentality and behavior. So one of the things that we do is we essentially connect on a task basis and on a job basis or a very micro job. That's not, it's not a nine to five job. It's not a monthly job. It's actually for a one hour job. And each job then can be tagged with skills if you think about it. So if I know that you're doing a flyering job, I know that if you're good at it and you're rated well, five star out of five, I can tag you in my system as someone that's pretty good with human interactions, people skills, customer service, and then this can then start providing better data, not only to the individual, so he starts getting badges about, oh, I'm really good at customer service, maybe I'll keep doing more jobs alongside, but also for the larger data collection that we do, we can even provide it to educators to say, wow, so these are the type of jobs that people are demanding. These are the type of uh, performance that the society in this nation is delivering. We need to upskill these areas in terms of skills, and we can actually provide that. So that's something that is really important, in my opinion, for how we can build that mentality of let's keep learning. Let's keep getting more skill, t skill tags, skill badges on GoGet so that we can actually move up and, and get more opportunities through that. So that's something that we do through the technology, and I believe a lot of other companies can start doing because of that. Would you like to jump in, Howley, at this point on educational reform and the structures yeah. to make it happen? Yeah, thank you. It's a very interesting discussion. I think uh, 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 I fully agree with the DPM and the, and the uh, panelists on the uh, critical importance of uh, education revolution, you can say, right? And starting from uh, primary uh, schools, you know, that you create critical thinking. But let me maybe just uh, mention our own example when we talk about the future of jobs, right? The UNDP uh, is the, the UN's largest uh, development organization that was created 50 plus years ago as a channel of resources to developing countries. And, uh, we had a lot to do with the Singapore's development strategy. You know, right? okay. Thank you. And as much as with uh, Vietnam, you know, we were involved uh, 40 years ago with Vietnam you know, to work together on development policies and so forth. So back then we were a donor, you know, we, had, we channeled a lot of resources of donors to uh, developing countries. So we had a lot of jobs. When I joined the UN uh, 25 years ago, you know, still, I had, still I'm 25 years, I can't believe it, right? It's okay, you're going to live right. to 120. Right. <laughs> so uh, I was told that, you know, our job is to walk ourselves out of a job. Because we wanted to help developing countries to develop and then there would be no need for an agency like us. Of course, we don't want to work ourselves out of a job. We need a job, right? Mm -hmm. so, so what we do is that we just have to change it with the times, you know, adapt ourselves to uh, the changing world. I guess the future of jobs, again, is the same, that you have to look at where the growth will come from. 
What are the future demands? And you invest in these areas. That is the logic. We work with a lot of governments on uh, planning, on growth strategies. I think this is the way, for, for job creation, you have to invest, period. Okay, right. Education is just one area. It is critical. Right? And uh, in our, again, in my uh, organization, for example, we are not totally not a donor. Right? We are trying to add value right? by providing services to our governments that they need you know, in terms of innovation, ideas, connecting ideas to resources that we don't have. Right? So in my own area, Asia Pacific, we had 4,500 people. We have now cut 1,000 of them over the last five years. But not only did we you know, do that, we changed, <coughs> lot, we changed the skill mix of people. Right? So I guess for the future of jobs, you know, uh, we, you know, our framework is to look at uh, the sustainable development goals of the 2030 development <coughs> agenda as a, a framework of reference. Because if you look at this, you, know, uh, you have uh, so many new areas that are needed. If you look at environmental protection, you have renewable energy, for example. Right? If you look at urbanization issues, you have so many smart city applications that can create, you know, I would say, millions of jobs you know, across the board. Right? And if you really look at uh, you know, uh, the plastics, which is a big issue that we're talking about in this session, right? you have, again, you know, a, a, a whole class of industry on recycling <coughs> and so forth. Right? So I guess the idea here is that uh, we need to not only look at education, certainly you know, lifelong learning, and the entrepreneur skills you know, that, you know, uh, that will allow people to get jobs, not just a traditional lifelong you know, uh, employment right? mm. and so forth. So uh, one thing that you know, I observe that quite strikingly is uh, how much you know, a country invests in R&D. Okay? When it talks to few jobs. For Asian countries, middle-income countries on average, we invest 0.5% of the GDP in R&D, okay, right. and the Japan invests about 3%. Now China increased from 1.4% five years ago to now more than 2%. So that's why you see that, in, we increasingly see that academic institutions are able to turn in innovation, new discoveries into marketable products and creating thousands, tens of thousands of jobs. So I think uh, when we look at the self-employment of small and medium enterprises as a critical part of future jobs, right? self-employment and so forth, so we need to really look at the investment in future growth areas. And that is country by country based on your competitive advantage and so forth. So when you say country by country, I mean, and creating that platform for people to create jobs. I mean, yesterday I heard uh, Aung San Suu Kyi talking about her own country in Myanmar and how they were trying to sort of leapfrog and get into the fourth industrial revolution, you know, when they have been behind in that sense. And the kind of training that they needed was more skills-based and vocational and um, apprenticeships. Yeah. Do you see that as a big area for...? for yeah, uh, and, uh, you know, Myanmar, okay, uh, has 5% uh, of the uh, business that is five years and old. Uh, less, five years and less, okay. With Vietnam, I understand there's 40% of that. That means uh, there's a lot of dynamism in Vietnam compared to Myanmar. Okay, right? So you see the distance right, between the, the kind of skills you know, uh, and also entrepreneurship skills you know, uh, that are not there in, in Myanmar okay, in order to catch up you know, uh, this, uh, with this revolution, so to speak. You know? And uh, Malaysia has uh, offered a very good example because Malaysia has, uh, I think, redesigned high education you know, uh, uh, strategy. That is uh, talking about uh, so-called the two I, two uh, two year two I, you know, the two year university and the two year industry uh, uh, apprenticeship, you know, okay. And they also have a CEO faculty, you know, uh, in their you know the new the strategy, you know, that uh, in, uh, provides uh, that invites the industry leaders, you know, to you know uh, provide uh, education you know, to uh, their uh, students. So in a way. Really, that's country by country. You know. Malaysia is the highest, let's say, the most developed you know, developing countries uh, in Asia Pacific, highest income, right, and the human development level. Right. So, but I think every country has opportunity. There's a, the, the, the potential is significant, essentially. Right. So we just need to focus on the right strategy, and invest. You know. I think that's an important point that it does vary country to country, and we need to get that that degree of um, nuance to the discussion because. 
if we don't, the, the future of jobs and the future of work could give rise to even more massive inequalities across countries. And I think the survey findings that came out which showed the Singaporeans being the most pessimistic was not surprising to me because it's a very high cost country. That would be an area for automation. And you can see why people would worry about it. But at a different end of the spectrum, we hear the need to catch up with not just the third, but let alone the fourth. So the variations in country to country, I think, is a very important point. But I, I did want to come back to a point that the uh, Deputy Prime Minister made earlier about empowering people to create their own jobs. And you touched on this as well, you know, the investments from governments in the infrastructure, um, getting the, the barriers to entry for entrepreneurship to be low and at lower costs so that people can experiment and try. Is this something you're working on in Vietnam to get easy for people to start companies and become like Francesca and set up go-getters? Yes, of course. Uh, độc lập với cái câu chuyện là... Even without IR 4.0, economies like Vietnam are compelled to reform its business climate so that businesses, domestic or foreign businesses, when they come here, so that they can thrive. So in recent years, Vietnam has been making much efforts to improve its business climate and how to empower people to create their own jobs and to have a certain level of flexibility, like the other speaker said. Well, Vietnam needs to take even greater efforts. Vietnam, Myanmar, and Indonesia <coughs> and Cambodia are behind countries like Singapore. So we need to do two things at once. So when we want to empower people to create their own jobs, apart from creating a legal framework conducive to startups and entrepreneurship, there are two important things that we need to do. First is education. It's not about more STEM lessons in class, like Lee said, but there are many other jobs that need to take care of human and human emotions. And in the education revolution, apart from STEM and techniques, we need to educate people to love other people because in many other jobs in the future, you need to take care of your customers' emotions or satisfaction. And second, in Vietnam, there's something different. Vietnam, in Vietnam, people has often has two jobs. Even government officials, they have their own part-time jobs. Or people in the private sector, they also have two jobs. So Vietnam, the Vietnamese uh, workers, even amid the Asian financial crisis in 1997, they still stood resilient because they had two. They had used to have two jobs at once. So before, it used to be a part-time job that add to their income. But those part-time job now is not only additional or auxiliary, but we need to develop these uh, second job to target uh, jobs that cater to human uh, emotions. So we are now having like 12,000 centers for community-based uh, training centers. And we also have uh, several organizations, social organizations, collaborating with the, uh, the ministries, line ministries, so that through these 12,000 community-based training centers, we can equip people with knowledge, with the knowledge about the market, so that they can create their own jobs. I would like to talk beyond Vietnam. Jia talk about a flexible part-time job. 
our lead talk about uh, attracting talents. Well, jobs now can be performed online. If you don't have good policies, they can sit in Vietnam and they can work for companies in Japan, in the United States, for instance. And today, I speak in Vietnamese with assistance from our interpreters, but with speech recognition technologies in the near future, the barrier, language barriers will be removed, abolished. So the movement of labor within ASEAN and also the global movement of labor, we need to take into account the advances in technology because today the language barrier is no longer a problem and people can sit in one place to work for do the jobs in different other places and bring the audience into the discussion are there questions or comments people would like to make and get involved in the discussion as well just raise your hand and we'll try and get a mic to you Yes, please, gentlemen over there. Or just, we can hear you, I think. Oh, yeah, I've got a very loud voice. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, really, maybe for government, I mean, the Australian government, but I was glad to hear I turned 60 this year. You can say I don't look 60, but I did turn 60. And um, I just want to stand about the, the challenges between, like, government retirement ages. You know, I'm based in Bangkok. Government is 60. Where in the UK, when I left, it was 65 and it's gone up to 67. So how do people manage where some people want to retire, want to have the flexibility to retire because they've had enough working? And then there's some that uh, would like to continue working because they want to continue to support their family. How do governments and business that sort of challenges? On one hand, retirement age is 60, 65, and people want to retire. But on other ages, people want to work and don't want to be Forced, forced to retire. Thank you. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe not directly to this question, but I think it's a very relevant issue. It is a question of uh, social security and social safety net, essentially. There's a movement uh, now among young people uh, called the FI, you know, uh, financially independent and retire early. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so essentially it's about uh, you know, uh, having enough savings to maintain a lifestyle right, that, that you think is comfortable. That's what it is. You know. But uh, not everybody can do that. Right? When we talk about entrepreneurship, most people cannot be entrepreneurs. That's, that's the reality. So why is the government you know, is doing everything you know, uh, the, uh, the government should do right, to encourage entrepreneurship, provide you know, an con uh, enabling environment? We need to look at all kinds of jobs in the future still. Right? And the one of the issue here is the social safety net, so that people you know, uh, can deal with shocks. So, so we need to do also everything possible to build a resilience mm -hmm. in the system and among people to deal with that. There are traditional social uh, protection schemes, transfers, right? needs-based uh, transfer. Now there are discussions about universal uh, income right? that have been experimented in some countries. Right? Now, estimates show that it can cost anywhere between 5% and upwards of GDP if you want to provide the system, right? And uh, you also have uh, uh, different kinds of contributory or non-contributory pension fund schemes and so forth, right? So again, this is another very big set of policy issues. And there's, there's no single you know, uh, uh, answer, right? And we need to, again, look at a mix of all these you know, uh, possibilities. So, uh Please. And if I could jump in on the role of then what startups or new waves of employment should play for that, it's also similarly we need to be able to provide that stability even though it's flexible jobs. Um, so one of the pains that technically part-timers and especially the gig economy jobs today is that they don't have, or people perceive that there's no stability and also they cannot contribute to the savings fund, personal, um, the retirement savings fund, and so then they can't even do things such as getting their own home loan or mortgages. Um, and that's something that also even the new type of work really needs to figure out and make sure that they can also, and we can also provide that. So in Malaysia, we work, um, and we're not the only ones, Grab has done it too, but we're talking to EPF to ensure that also part-timers are going to be able to choose to contribute um, for their own selves to ensure that they're safe for the future. And that's why we're really not only th talking about, I guess, employer and employee now. It's really employee creating that account for themselves. Mm. I think that's so important for the future. Right? 
to address things like being able to work until however old you would like to work mm -hmm. and to be able to then achieve whatever you would like to or spend on what you would like to when you're 80, right? And that's really important. Warren, I'd like to also uh, speak from a corporate standpoint. Sure. Uh, I, I think as from corporation standpoint, I think the choice is actually getting less and less to actually uh, get somebody that is productive but already pairs their you know, uh, what you call the retirement age, to tell them to leave, okay? You know, let's say in Japan, okay? Japan, you know, there is a big gap in terms of, uh, of, of, of different skill sets of people, okay? And um, if the retirement age is fixed and then they have to leave, you know, then there's going to be even a bigger gap in terms of, uh, of, of, of skills, you know, and, and workers. So I think from a corporation standpoint, that retirement age, uh, you know, age is probably going to be just a, 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 a point of time that you basically get gets your pension or something like that. But you can still have a choice to continue to work either on a full-time basis or on a part-time basis. Uh, I think that that's, that's, you know, we, we see so much of a talent uh, shortage, talent, talent mismatch. And, you know, we want to encourage the people that has the experience to continue to, to, to work, continue to contribute. But we are will, even willing to spend uh, effort in terms of retraining them, reskilling them, you know, to, to, to make that, that, uh, that uh, lifespan longer. I mean, in, in yeah. Singapore, they've launched a program called Skills Future, yes. where every citizen is given a certain amount of money to, <coughs> to invest in yourself, to train and learn new skills. And I was discussing this with the education minister, and he's quite broad-minded about it. He says, yes, you should be learning practical skills, mm -hmm. but he's also open to you learning to do Chinese brush painting or, or whatever you want, partly to send a signal that it's all about you taking the effort to learn and improve yourself and continue to, that, to do that throughout your life, which is, I think, something we're going to have to do as we live to 120, but let me go to Virginia. Yes, it's, it's actually on the point about 120 years old. So if we are all going to live to 120 years old, 60 is the new mid-life, okay? <laughs> so, so every one of us is really underage in this room. So, and I think the thing is also about the slash economy, right? So that you could have the flexibility to be engaged in different career options at different points in life, and it can be intergenerational. So what I would submit to for all of us to think about is productivity until the age that we are 120. But at the same time, it's a really fast and slow game that we need to be engaged with. So that as the economy moves faster, individuals, citizens within the economy have the option of going fast or slow and engage intergenerational workforce through that. Is there another question from the floor, lady, please? Can we get a mic to this lady? Coming around to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the very interesting discussion. I've got several inputs um, coming in. And uh, for Ms. Lau, you've mentioned earlier that uh, we have to make businesses closer to the classroom, or I would say vice versa, bring classroom closer to the industry. But in a country like the Philippines, um, we, we have so much population, millions of them, and our students, uh, we have this what we call um, immer work immersion program, but the industry can absorb so much. So meaning that more people or more students have less chances of getting into the industry to get on the job um, training. That's one. So w what policy recommendations or what program recommendations can you uh, give to a country like the Philippines with a huge number of population? Secondly, uh, the deputy minister was mentioning about um, human emotions, uh, taking good care of our customers' um, emotions. But in our IT BPM industry or business process uh, outsourcing, uh, we are... Um, faced with our workers being bashed and slashed by customers online. So it, it takes a lot also of emotions to absorb. So um, it's also has something to do about health and safety also of our uh, workers. Thank you. 
Would you like to address the question yes. of bringing classrooms closer to the right. workplace? Right. Thanks for that. And I think it's more than just the Philippines, right? You know, we have many countries in ASEAN that actually has a very high youth population waiting to be very productive in the new economy. And, and yeah, we won't be able to immerse, you know, students into the workplace if we think about with our traditional blinkers. Right? But if we are able to take off those blinkers and think about really reaching many of them, number one, through technology, through technology as the amplifier so that you know, the workplace can be much closer to their future workforce and engage them in a very immersive sort of co-development because the future belongs to us, but it also belongs to our young people. So bring them in early. And it's actually to the benefit of the corporates if they are able to bring in the young people early so that they can co-design products, they can co-design services in the future. So that is the, that is the first point I would say. You know, make use of technology, at the same time really involve industry early. And we have many classic examples that a lot of companies, they are rushing into schools. They are rushing into schools because they cannot wait to really absorb the creative creativity from our young people so that they can co-create the future, co-create products and services. But at the same time, I think we are here sitting you know, at the brim of the fourth industrial revolution, bring in technology, use technology as the amplifier so that we will be able to get to them and they can come to us. Anybody else like to jump? Yeah, I would also like to share even how Malaysia government has tried to address this. Um, so specifically, in we talk about uh, digital marketing, coding as skills that really needed to kind of be um, kind of groomed for this for this industry revolution. And so what um, Magic and what other agencies have done is they've actually fostered a lot of these, um, what I would say. Um, uh, stopgap solutions for education that's clearly not yet caught up because no one's teaching how to code or no one's teaching how to be a digital marketer in university. Um, but what they did is they fostered and allowed them to have, a, um, have the academy in their space, um, give them incentives to start this up and to, um, and to share even our CTO was from one of the programs from there. So you can see how, so maybe there, um, the, if the population is not, um, there's a lot of population, they're ready, they're they're, they're wanting to be involved and to, to lead and also create jobs um, to, be, to be part of this revolution. Part of the government role is to identify what are the, what are the specific, I guess, um, careers or job responsibilities that we need to foster for that. Um, and then figure out how we can also just create incentives for the stopgap solutions for the private sector to come and fill it, but at least provide the space for them. And so these academies now literally churn out um, really uh, fast um, engineers that's converted to be a CTO, um, an old uh, traditional marketer to be a digital marketer, to quickly move in. And they do it in six months and nine months, and they start just learning on the job after that and running um, platforms like ours or contributing to other um, digital marketing agencies, which is really great initiative that I think Malaysia has done. So co-creation and collaboration. Ian, please. Uh, I, think, I think there's uh, two things over here. Um, you know, I think if you look at ASEAN, our education system basically for tertiary education is basically geared towards preparing for employment. But think about this. If there is really uncertainty about employment, mm. is our educational system right or should we be, be moving towards more like the, you know, the apprentice? You, you look at what happened to Switzerland, you know, the apprentice program, you know, and all those things where it is basically a, 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 a combination of uh, some, some, some fundamental skills, but more to get towards the practical knowledge and all those things. And this probably cannot be just, uh, you know, one or two schools that is doing that, but probably has to be a, sort of like a, a pan, you know, uh, pan countries or pan region types of, of program that uh, uh, make people suitable for jobs. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing is that, the, you know, there are actually uh, a lot of uh, uh, private institutions that is preparing for changes for people like coding schools, you know, uh, that is actually getting very popular in the US. You're talking about people changing careers. I, there are lawyers that basically, you know, get into coding. Yeah. 
okay? Uh, because, you know, during 2008, 2009, the crisis, you know, a lot of jobs are just not in existence already. So, you know, I think the, 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 the government needs to promote that, but also, you know, the private sectors also needs to promote that. Right. So that flexibility of mind to go into areas right. which are completely new to you. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in my newsroom, for example, we're doing exactly the same. We're we are transforming the newsroom from print to multimedia. Right. And honestly, we can't really tell where the technology is going. And if, if I said I knew where the media would be in 10 <laughs> years, I'd be lying. And any media leader would be lying. But I think what we can do is equip our, our staff with that nimbleness of mind so they can adapt as the technologies come to them. I think that's as much as we can do looking into the future. Now, we're running out of time and I'm, I'm on a very tight Swiss clock. So I'm going to ask the panel to, to leave us with a, a parting thought. And just to focus the, this, that, that parting thought, I'd like you to say, to think about that survey that was done by the WEF and the optimism from the young people about the future of technology and how it's going to mean more jobs and higher salaries. Just tell us, do you share that optimism on a scale of 1 to 100? Where are you and why? I'll start with Howley. Yeah, uh, that's a tough question. You know? That's not <laughs> what I planned uh, for my conclusion uh, sentence. But uh, uh, I guess, you know, uh, I, I think young people have enormous, you know, uh, energy and uh, uh, ability to adapt. So I think on the scale of 1 to 100, I would probably say uh, over 90. You know, Great. Say, right. I'm extremely optimistic, so I would, I would even go beyond 100. I, I genuinely believe... 120. <laughs> yes, 120. <laughs> um, I genuinely believe that the future is going to be bright. It, it, of course, when we go through change, everyone will have concern on what we or the key word in this conference was worrying um, about what um, the impact would mean. And no one likes change. Um, but if you also do look at the data historically, we've always actually um, improved humankind in every revolution. Um, and it is the matter of how do we make sure we do navigate the pros and cons correctly, especially in each nation as well or in each industry. Um, but I see it every day and I see it um, in the jobs that get created through the technology platforms. I see it in the upskilling of um, people in these code academies. Um, and there is no doubt that even also with data now, we're going to be able to inform education faster, which will then make education also more lean, which ultimately was that underlying factor that you're saying will, will be a longer term solution for, these, um, for, the, for this problem. So I'm very optimistic. You? <laughs> You know, I'm actually very op optimistic and I really would like to be 30 years old younger. <laughs> no, but, but truly, why, why I, felt, uh, why I feel, felt optimistic is because when I look forward, there's just so much of changes. Although you can say changes, there's uncertainty in changes, but also changes represent opportunities. Okay? And uh, these types of opportunities was never in existence 30 years ago. And, um, you know, I think the information age, the information, uh, I would say, revolution has brought everything very close to us. So I am actually very optimistic. We've got a 90, it. we've got 120. <laughs> and you're, you're at? I am at uh, probably about 90 to 100. Wow, okay. <laughs> well, this is going to be shocking. <laughs> I am known to be dangerously optimistic. And I'm known to be dangerously positive because when we look into the eyes of our youth, we see future. And how can we not be positive? And when we look, when we talk about youth, many of us in this room are youth as well because we are all going to live to 120 years old. We believe you. Right? So, so what I believe is the fact that we have such an opportunity of, in our hands in the history making, in the civilization of human history, that we will create a generation that will be so much better for our next generation, not only because there is technology, not only because there is AI, not only because all this you know, enabling technology, because at the end of it, there is a return to humanity. It's the return to humanity that we believe that we are all going to use what we have to create a better world, not just for ourselves, for generations to come. I'm 300%. <laughs> Deputy Prime Minister, since we're in your lovely country, you have the last word. I, I'm, I'm optimistic. Like your people? 
<laughs> but uh, as the Vice Prime Minister of Vietnam, I have to add one thing. Uh, being optimistic, but don't forget to manage or to think and to manage the challenges. And to learn from the other country, particularly in the region we have Singapore, we have Malaysia, you are in the leading group. <coughs> Thank you. So there you Can I just, uh, I'm sorry to take the last word away from the DPM. But I think I just want to strengthen what he said, you know. I think there are a lot of vulnerable groups of people yes, yeah. who will need a lot of help. Yeah. So uh, the, 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 when manifestations are working poor, okay, in a lot of places, they're working hard and so forth, right? And they will always have these challenges. We will always have these challenges. So again, come back to the sustainable development goals. We really need to think about what we can do together in partnerships, so called to leave no one behind. You know? I think the challenges. That's a good point. I think a lot of reason for optimism, but also some sense of reality that we do have challenges. And if we don't work at those challenges, then we don't maximize the opportunities. So I think that's a good point to end our discussion. Please join me in thanking the panelists for a very engaging session. <laughs>